Good evening, class. How's everyone doing today? It is exciting. Um, it's an exciting day on a Wednesday, um, day after uh, a time that's been very anticipated in this country for a couple of years, um, and it's still going on. Um, but I want us to go ahead and talk a little bit about business entrepreneurship um, today. Um, today, we're going to discuss money, 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 money. Uh, we're going to, uh, this is one of three parts. So for the next three classes, we're going to discuss finances, um, financial uh, for your business plan. We're going to discuss uh, briefly personal finances, um, but we're also going to uh, have two presenters who's going to discuss the importance of creating sound financial systems for your business as well. So we are really excited. Um, in the next for the next two uh, three for the next three weeks um, for us uh, to, to have this to have this uh, discussion today uh, we will have we have a brief class um, we, we will be one um, working on uh, doing some housekeeping we'll be discussing the midterm um, I, I posted your grades today um, if you haven't seen your midterm grades today um, they, they were posted um, for the most part, all of the midterms were really good. Um, so thank you for all the work that you all have done um, with them. We're also gonna have a brief discussion on financials. This, this will serve as the, this will serve as the orientation um, of our of financial, uh, our financial discussion for this class. Um, you will have a speaker next week uh, financial advisor next week and a financial advisor the week after that um, to discuss more specifically on personal finances. And then um, the next week we'll discuss the importance of having strong business finances. So we have a great block, of, a great group of pre uh, presenters who's going to talk to you about, about those things. Of course, um, my expectation um, it's for people to ask questions, think critically, build on your existing ideas, be open to criticism, and most importantly, have fun. Housekeeping. First thing I want to talk about are our financial workshop presentations. So um, as mentioned earlier, uh, you will have a, a special, two special guests, um, one next week, um, that's going to focus on personal finances and the one the week after, which is going to be business finances. I think it's these next two class periods, the next class and class afterwards, are very important for attendance. Um, also, um, these they're going to provide great information, great insight for not only your final paper, but also for how you can um, operate your personal finances. Um, this is going to be uh, something that's not only beneficial um, for you in this class, but after class as well. Secondly, midterm feedback. Overall, great job on your midterms. I think all of y'all did a, a really good job in describing all four um, facets, um, your narratives, your financials, the operations, and your competition. Um, I do have some feedback. I want to say um, the lowest, it looks like, hold on, people are still coming in. Um, for the most part, people um, had all had great ideas. I mean, it varied from a candle company um, to uh, a, a doctor's office to um, all sorts of things, uh, being economically friendly. And so the business ideas were great. Um, it was good to see that. Um, you all, in terms of proofing um, your paper and in terms of going over and editing, um, you all did a really, really good job. Um, I initially was going to be super critical on that, but honestly, I lacked uh, giving you this paper back in two weeks, so I was a bit more lenient. Um, so I did not um, grade your, your papers on grammatical errors as much as I would have originally. Um, honestly, because you all did your part in turning it in um, on the 16th, and I didn't get it to you until today. So I wanted to give you all that type of um, break. You all have been doing great work these last couple of weeks, playing catch up on assignments, things of that nature. And so I wanted to thank you all 
um, for continuing to hang in there this semester. So continue to keep striving, keep fighting. I know this is a difficult time. Um, you all aren't the only ones that are being affected by this, um, this time, this workload. Um, as professors, uh, we are really, uh, there's a lot of work going on here. During COVID, they're, they are giving us much more um, responsibility that we typically have in the traditional semester. That's not an excuse, that's just a reason. So with that reasoning, um, I am becoming, I am more flexible um, with your, your submission in terms of your midterm submissions. I have also caught up for the most part, all of your grades. Um, so the assignments that you have received, that you have submitted to me, um, they should be graded. If you all have any questions, please let me know there. Um, you can let me know after after class. Before we go further, does anyone have any comments or feedback on their midterm that their group uh, wrote? No? Okay, good. I do want to state that everyone, I still need to adjust a couple of grades. Um, how the computer is set up, how Canvas is set, set up. When I submitted a uh, grade, presentate each group's grades, um, they accounted for everyone in the group. After class today, I will be um, making edits to that um, for people who um, sent messages stating either one, uh, they had team members that weren't responsive, um, their grade will be uh, adjusted. They will not receive credit for the midterm unless they provided a, a written excuse which i received one written excuse from the student um so um that i will talk to that group um later on at the end of the season at the end of our class today. um but for the most part i thought y'all did a great job i do want to make a couple comments on um your work a couple of groups as you know, we, I wanted to put an emphasis on the narrative and the competition portion of the paper. Um, a couple of groups didn't um, write their com competition paper as in depth, um, which caused um, some, some points to be taken off. Um, but everyone's narrative was, was fairly solid. Um, I was sold at six separate businesses that uh, I was sold on via the, by, by way of the narrative. So y'all did a great job on that. Um, but um, for the next several weeks, we're going to focus on equipping you with the tools so that you can write your financial statements, which a lot of you all did a really good first stab at it. So y'all did a great, I want to say kudos to that. Um, but secondly, um, it's really important for us to, to, to beef up our operations as well, which a lot of you all have done as well. Most of you most of the groups, uh, you all will have minor tweaks in terms of between your midterm and your final paper. So the good news is um, I feel comfortable in all the, um, the papers that I've read that you all are in a good direction going to your final. And all you have to do is really tweak, maybe alter some arranging some things on your, from your midterm to your final. So I'm not looking for you to copy paste. Um, but you all don't have to, you all have done a lot of the heavy lifting already from your midterm submission. So great job on that. I want to let you know that um, y'all did a great job. On that. Before I go to the next subject, I know I asked for, for feedback before on my explanation, but does anyone have any feedback now after I've explained a little bit on the midterm? Not you, oh you yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, um, But you mentioned um, the competition not being uh, in depth. Um, I know we're probably going to have to do. Uh, we're going to be doing that the um, group project down the line and be and finishing it. Um, could you uh, explain at least a little bit may, what you may be expecting more down the line with yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Great question. So. Um, a couple of you all did, a lot of you all stated direct and indirect competitors, but they were still, uh, they were still general, um, generic. Um, there are some things I was looking for, particularly with uh, competitions in terms of people's geographical location um, and how that relate, is related to in competition. A couple of you all 
compared businesses, but it was um, a lot of them were virtual businesses, which is fine. Um, but I think at least five of the six companies also had um, brick and mortar competition that uh, I, I was looking to see um, how, how in depth you would go in with that. And I would want you to do that a little bit more for your final. Um, a good example is um, I would want you to maybe establish a region or a neighborhood, excuse me, that you will have your business office. And then I want one of uh, several of your competitors um, to be um, in relation to where your office is geographically. So for example, um, you may have, I'll use the candle company. There's a candle company um, that's one, one of your papers. I wanna say it's group three, I believe. Um, group three um, has that, and they, they stated comp competitors, um, but there's some more competition um, and that are within a geographical area, whether it's in Fort Worth, Arlington, Dallas, um, and I want to see those competitors as well, um, because that's important um, as well. This, this is not just a 100% online uh, market yet. Did I answer your question, Otto? Cool, good deal. Any other questions or comments? Okay, great. Your CRED assignment survey two is available. Um, actually, um, next week, I, I wanted to go over it this week. I haven't had a chance to look at it um, yet. And so I will go over the CRED assignment next week. I may have to alter the deadline as well to right before Thanksgiving, just FYI. I wanna say it's due week 13. So just, uh, just be on the lookout. We'll be discussing CRED next week. All right. Group presentation, we, uh, we've talked about the midterm. Um, now I want us to, I want you all to focus um, for your final for your final presentation on how you're going to pitch to me specifically um, and how you will be presenting it, uh, whether it's through, it's going to be virtual. So your entire group will have to coordinate um, and, and do a Zoom uh, presentation to me only. We will schedule a time, I will block out 20 minutes um, for each group to present. Um, each group will have 10 minutes to make their presentation, um, but each group will have 20 minutes uh, block time so that allow us to log in, get things set up, and for me to ask a couple of questions. Um, and it's gonna be really important um, for you to um, have great program flow as well as optics in terms of PowerPoints or diagrams you're gonna use for your presentation um, because those are the two extra things that will be um, graded on outside of just your paper that you all have already submitted in your midterm. All right, we'll go over that in the next couple of weeks. Yes, Carolyn. Um, we're pitching to you as if you're an investor? Yes. Okay, got it. Originally, I was going to have a panel of people, but I was like, no, nah, it's the COVID. We'll wait. I'll be signing for you all. All right. Are there any other questions? Okay. Extra credit assignments. Um, one of you all started submitting extra credit. Um, that's great. Uh, we have there are 10 slots your extra credit um, portion um, of Canvas under assignments that you can submit. Um, if you submit a half page times New Romans 12 font, double spaced um, on what event you attended, um, please state that in one of the 10 slots and then I'll give you credit based on each assignment. I will also send you um, flyers um, of events that's happening in November um, so that you can have op option to, to attend that virtually so that you all can get some extra credit. I know the Career Services Center um, are having a series of career fairs this month and workshops this month that will be provided that I'll be accepting extra credit um, for that portion. Any questions? When you do the extra credits, you don't have to do them in assigned order, right? You could no. Okay. There's no there's no numeric order for it. I just wanted to provide 10 slots for you all to submit 
as as the maximum of ten extra credit opportunities. Any other questions? Great question. Okay. Lastly, have you all received your emails from Rhythm from Jay Gannon? It had to have been a couple of weeks ago. It'll be in your UNT Dallas emails. So if you all would, please check your UNT Dallas email. If you can, check right now. Um, and I want to see if you all have received the Rhythm email. If you can. I haven't received anything from Jake. Yes, it may have been October 23rd. Or maybe October 16th or October 23rd. If you type I know in. that, that um, I think it was two weeks ago when we we're uh, having the discussion saying it was coming our way. Mm -hmm. I remember being on the lookout for it and I haven't seen anything. I'm checking right now. Okay, and rhythm is spelled R-H-I-P-A-M. So if y'all can, and look, that, look in your UNT Dallas emails. I wonder if it goes to the junk email on the other side. Let me yeah, check junk because it's it's not from an internal source. Either, so. okay. I'll give you a couple minutes. Take a look at it. Okay, so I haven't received anything. You haven't. Y'all are looking for UNT Dallas emails. Yeah. Yeah, I, I haven't received anything. Mm -mm. Okay. Good deal. Thanks for letting me know. Let me send Jake a message real quick. Hold on. None of my technology wants to work for some reason. I have an off-ball question yes. not related to this class. Do mm -hmm. you have a nursing program? UNT Dallas? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I, okay. I believe UNT may be the Health Science Center, maybe, in okay. Fort Worth, possibly. Okay. But not the UNT Dallas Undergraduate Law School. I was working with the Career Center. I had a position in HR, and I know we have a program for HR um, to post out on the upcoming career fair. Okay. Um, but I didn't know if they had nursing or not, because I was sure was going to put up a lot of stuff for nursing. Okay. Thank you. I'm trying to get some new grads. Understandable. Understandable. All right, well, what I'll do is I'll reach out to Jake. Reach down to him now. All right, I just sent him a message. And what we'll do is uh, start the rhythm process next week, all right? Good deal. All right, so before we get started, um, I just want us to just have a brief discussion, a brief dialogue. And if you can, please turn your videos on on your, on your, on, on your Zoom uh, for us to talk about financials in a business plan. Uh, by this time, a lot of all of you all have done some type of financial portion of your business uh, in your business plan in your midterm. And so now I just want to hear from you your idea of why the financial portion is important. Why is it important for a business to have healthy financials? Well, I mean, you money to buy equipment, um, pay employees, mm -hmm. um, even to file for your proper business license um, and permits and things like that, you're going to need enough capital. Exactly. Exactly. Great job, Carol. What, what, what's another reason? What are some other reasons why having strong financials is important in your business? I think 
going to also supply, I mean, supply like benefits because some companies offer benefit plans, but they also pick up a big portion for their employees so they don't have that financial burden. And then also like to give out bonuses and stuff. Um, so from personnel cost, I think, and then be able to provide raises and so forth um, and be able to stay in the market with competition with your competitors. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You brought up some great points. And um, and you're actually bringing up a point of view that most employees don't see. Like most employees see that they get paid a certain dollar amount an hour or they're salaried at a certain amount. Um, but if you're looking from a manager or an owner's perspective, um, you should um, calculate, I think that the formula is calculating someone's salary or someone's hourly rate three times. So times three um, is, is the value of an employee for each business. Why is that important? Because employee employers have a responsibility to pay insurance for training, um, for all these types of things that make uh, the employee successful, whether it's equipment, things of that nature, travel, um, all of those have to take into a, be taken into account in your financial statement. And it's a little different than just getting a paycheck once or twice a month and you figuring out your personal finance type, when you pay your bills, when you can have fun with your friends, when you can buy groceries for your family. For an entrepreneur, um, you have to kind of think um, a little bit differently um, in terms of how responsible financially you are because you have to take into account, you know, I have to have 30 days worth of cash readily available so I can pay my employees. What happens if you as an employer don't have enough money for payroll? What will happen? What could happen? You won't have employees and then you'll have lawsuits. <laughs> right, yep. exactly. So some people, some people, um, especially entrepreneurs who are self-employed, um, we take on the burden of not getting paid or not paying ourselves if we don't get quite, if we don't get paid for the job yet. That's the risk entrepreneurs make. I do, I make that risk all the time. So there are times when I haven't been paid three, four, five, six months, right? Fortunately, I had enough money in the reserves so that my employees who are either support staff, professional services, who are, whom I need, bookkeepers, accountants, attorneys, things of that nature, if I want them to continue to work, I have to pay them. And so um, this goes back to one of my first sessions mm -hmm. in that you have to be, um, people think that being an entrepreneur means being your own boss, which means you don't have to, uh, you have freedom to do things. Well, you also have a burden um, to be much more responsible than you have to be if you were an employee somewhere and you have management or a group of people dictating what you do day in and day out. One of those um, things that you have to have self-discipline on it, are your financials. You have to be able to not spend every money that you receive, um, especially as an, as an employer, because you never know when you need that money in the future. You never know. And if you don't have enough money to pay your employees, they have no reason to work for you for free. If they do, that's great for them. That's amazing for you. But most of the time, um, if people, if you don't give people their money, they are not going to uh, give you work, right? They're not gonna give you their labor. Any other reasons why it's important for you to have a solid financial, um, solid financials in your business or your business plan? Well, you can't get any more investors if you don't have your money um, correctly. Um, what I'm, the word I'm looking for? If you don't, if you're not on point, who wants to give you more money for your business? They're going to say you're wasting your money. You don't know what you're doing with your money. Exactly, and that's why we are going to dedicate one class to talking about personal finances. Now, I'm not, I'm not doing this because I'm assuming you all have poor financial. Um, responsibilities. It's not what I'm doing. That's not why I'm inviting them here. What I, why I'm inviting them 
um, to to and why I'm focusing on personal finances um, before we go into business finance discussion is because every person, every investor, banker, um, grants, if you have grants, um, everyone's going to want to see the operator's financial viability. You don't have to be rich. This doesn't mean you're rich to have a business ownership. It just means we just want to see if you're responsible. If you're making $50,000 a year, what are you doing with that $50,000? Are, um, are you using it appropriately? Are you spending it on luxurious items? Kayla, did you just say no? Or are you talking about <laughs> You're like, nah, my I'm just, the, best, the best car is cool. You know, my husband was just fussing at me earlier because he was like, look at your bank account. Ah, <laughs> ah. Yeah, buddy, I, th those are real conversations. Um, and, and, and <laughs> very real conversations <laughs> in a marriage, right? And so those are all very important. It's very important uh, to have personal financial literacy and sustainability. Um, because that is just an indicator for what you will do um, in your business. All right. So we're just going. I'm, today I'm just going over a couple of slides. We're not going to be too long, um, but I want us to. I want to set the stage for what we're going to discuss in the next couple of weeks. All right. Good deal. So one thing that I want to state that's very important is that it's really important for us to prepare our finances before starting your business. A lot of people um, like to ready, fire, aim. So they, they have this idea of I have this business that we can, I can start. And then uh, they just do it. And then as they are doing it, they are understanding that there are costs that's associated and they're just paying for things without prepping for it, right? Is that, Will you fail if you do that? Not necessarily. None of these things that I'm going to say is set in stone. These are just, this is just advice. But when you are ready firing and aiming, you're not really planning financially, um, you run the risk of not having um, enough, uh, enough preparation, enough legs, uh, enough space to work with um, to build and sustain your organization. So that's why personal financial standards is very important. Um, you manage your personal money properly before trying to manage your business finances. That's important um, because managing your own your personal finances is a gradual process. Like everyone evolves in their financial literacy as an adult. I know my spending habits in my 20s were much different than my spending habits in my 30s, right? In my 20s, I spent money on a lot of superfluous stuff, a lot of things that really didn't, um, didn't matter much in the long run. It was great in the short run, um, but the long run, not so much. I remember, I don't know if I told this class this, but when we um, first had some success at Group Excellence, I went from driving a four-door Saturn. It was a Saturn. It had manual windows. Like, it was purple. It was a purple four-door Saturn, like a 1999 Saturn, and it was like 2010. So, like, it was it was a 10-year-old Saturn, four-cylinder, like manual windows, um, and I was supposedly the boss uh, of, of this organization. I was executive director. Well, one of my middle managers uh, approached me and said, "You know, Matt, I mean, you're a great boss and all, but you're driving this purple Saturn." How can I tell people my boss drives a four-door Saturn? And so me being, you know, 24, 25 years old, I said, well, you know what? I could change this quickly. So I, I paid you know, $70,000 for a truck, put some rims on it, threw some Ds on it, 20s, all black. And I made it a point to be seen everywhere I go. Um, at the time, I was clubbing. I went to bars when they had the VIP. I made sure it was detailed and they were going to have my truck in the front. Like, I wanted that type of stuff. Um, as I got older, I realized that's not really important. Like, I could have done much more um, financially with that. I could have bought, with that, with that money, I could have bought another business. I could have bought a building. 
right? I know that there was a, there's a book. The first book that motivated me to be an entrepreneur in college was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Um, I don't know if y'all have heard of this book called, it's by Robert Kiyosaki, um, but the title of the book is called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I'll write it in the, in the chat. This by far is the most comprehensive book on um, entrepreneurship that I've written. It's very simple. It's a story about a, a man who um, grew up in Hawaii and his father was superintendent of the school, the school district. Um, and as superintendent, they make good money. They make six figures. They are respected in the community. But in the book, he calls his biological father, the superintendent of, these, of the school district, who was esteemed and on the island, his poor dad. And his rich dad is this entrepreneur who um, wasn't flashy, but instead of um, making financial decisions for the short run, he continuously made long-term financial plays, which in the long run, really proved beneficial because he started owning a significant percentage of industry, right? And one of his examples um, was his poor dad was, in, was shopping for a Porsche. He wanted to buy an $85,000, $90,000 sports car, right? But as he was going to the dealership, he noticed that there was a warehouse that was for sale for eighty thousand dollars, and so he made a choice to, instead of buying a Porsche or buying a sport car, he decided to buy that building and put a business inside it. And what that did was, in five years, the building not only paid for itself, but it made a um, hundred thousand dollars of profit for him individually each of those years. So not, we're not talking about net profit. We're not talking about the gross profit of his business. He took away, the boss took away $100,000 alone on just a side business venture um, that he did by build, buying this building and putting um, something there that is money generated. So that book teaches you about that. So if you can, find that book. Rich Dad, Poor Dad is very popular. Um, it's been it's been in circulation for about 20, 25 years. All right, back to the PowerPoint slides. Personal credit. Let me go back one. One thing about personal finances, your personal credit is your initial foot in the door. Has everyone heard of your FICA score? Yeah, it's typically it's pretty much your credit rating from three large financial houses. Um, that uh, ranges from, it, it deviates uh, about 100 points based on your spending habits. But those are the indicators that lenders, that bankers, that people you are um, willing, uh, you're willing to do business with, or at least make a significant purchase of, will look at initially to see your viability uh, of doing business. Well, in the business world, if you're starting your own business, that is the first step people like to see. People want to see what your credit score is, your personal credit is. Do they want to see an 800 score? I mean, everyone wants to see an 800 score. Does this mean you can be you can't be an entrepreneur if your score is 400? Not necessarily. In fact, a lot of a lot of entrepreneurs. Um, credit ratings vary, right? They go up and down. Does anyone have any idea why entrepreneurs have such a volatile personal credit score? Um, because they, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I would say loans because of the amount of loans and money that they're borrowing. Uh, it definitely drops on the amount that you are taking out and then how much you pay back. Um, and then also, what's that called? Your um, gross versus what you currently have outstanding. Exactly. So in autumn, I'll get to you afterwards. Uh, but that's a great point. One, 
um, entrepreneurs take risks. And when you take risks, you probably take out loans or something um, that that requires you to take, they'll take some type of financial debt strategy, right? If you take out a loan, um, you have to pay it back monthly, right? Well, if you're an entrepreneur and you're and you don't have uh, a, uh, a a business, or if, if this is if this is your primary business, your entrepreneurship, and you don't have a business that's giving you a paycheck, um, it's difficult possibly to pay if someone if you don't get paid for your services. It's hard to pay your creditors, right? It's it's hard to pay credit card companies on time, things of that nature. That's what I, I still deal with that to this day. Um, it, it manifests in different ways. But when I was a young entrepreneur, it was hard for me to, I had a $50,000 line of credit, right? And so sometimes with that financial space, I didn't have enough money to pay for the bills, the lights, staff, things of that nature, uh, and clear out the debt at the same time. I wrote that this was, I had a personal guarantee for this money because I was a budding entrepreneur. No one really was going to co-sign for it. And so that affected my credit. Now, even though I had cash available, um, I still had to work on some credit score stuff. It depends on the life cycle of where you are financially. Some seasons, let's just say you your business is really popular in the spring and summer, but um, it's tough in winter. A good company, a good business opportunity of that is landscapers, right? People who sell snow cones and lemonades. They have more outdoor, I mean, this is, you know, pre-COVID. But this is whenever you have things with, that are seasonal, um, the, high, the peak seasons, you're probably cash heavy. But when you're in your off season, um, it's probably difficult to, 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 to get cash in but you may still have the same bills that needs to be paid. So that can affect uh, the cycle of where you are in your lending. Autumn, did you have something you were gonna add? Oh, I, I agree with both of you um, necessarily. My answer was just gonna be, you know, entrepreneurs take many risks. Um, you never know what the mar how the market may react. Um, you never know what will necessarily get in your way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but yeah, necessarily. Yeah, I agree with both of you guys. You guys said most of everything I was going to say. Cool, yo. Good deal. Good deal. I want to so, ask a question. Yeah. So does that mean that um, when you have a business that the bank is not looking at your credit score and, you, you know, as strongly as it would just a regular individual asking for a loan? Um because usually, I mean, because I'm not, I don't have a biz, business or anything, but my credit score is what drives like my car mm -hmm. interest rate and stuff like that. But when you're an entrepreneur, do the banks just look at your like financial statements and toss that credit rating out the window? How does that work? No, they still look at it. They still look at it, but there are other aspects, there are other facets. And so, for example, those three major credit scores from the FICA house, um, those are just three of about 90 credit indicators that you can, that financial institutions can identify what your score, what a score is. If you go into, um, and we're not gonna go deep into this, but there are individual business credit scores, right? Based on your, um, your habits and tendencies when you start a business um, that other inv investors, banks can look at as well. So that's why I purposely stated your personal credit is your initial foot in the door. So it is look, looked at, but it's, it's, uh, it's also based on the type of business that you're, you have, the type of assets that you have, um, because let's just say you, your credit isn't strong, but your intellectual property um, is very strong. You have a great, great contracts, let's just say, you have um, a business who's going to give you a $10 million contract. You don't have any money at this time, but you have the means to create something that will get you $10 million, but you need a million to start to create the widgets and to create the products so that you can sell them for the $10 million. Well, the bank 
if the bank knows that you have a guaranteed contract coming in and that your product is solid enough to where the assets could cover that loan, they may lend you, they may give you a $500,000 million uh, line of credit because they know you're going to make $10 million in the next three or four months. So that what they will do is if your credit score is low, they will attack on, they will give you a higher interest rate on the money that they borrow. From. So they're going to make more money because in their, your product, you are more risky because you don't have a high credit score or you're asking the bank for money, right? So the goal for entrepreneurs is to build up enough uh, reputation to where, let's just say, using this same example, I have, I have um, sold widgets, I've created things to where I have a million dollars in reserve because I know this million dollars will produce $10 million worth of profit. And so if I get a contract, if I'm awarded a contract and they need, let's say, however many units that equates to $10 million, I can instantly create it because I already have finances to get, to get the ball rolling. When you don't have those initial finances and you're looking for alternative models, then that's when banks, um, investors, private equity firms, things of that nature, take evaluate, you know, well, you bring on, you bring this, you need my money, my money is going to come at a cost. It'll be 5% or it'll be 10%. So if they loan you a million dollars, they're expecting 1.1 million whenever the, the end of the term. Does that make sense? Okay. I don't want to go too deep into it, but I'm just giving you a reason why personal, no, your personal, sense. what's that here? I was saying, yeah, that makes sense. I didn't know there were 90 credit models. Yeah, I want to say 86 or so credit models, um, that, but that's they, they're broken down um, in a lot of categories. For FYI, I don't even know all of them. I know several of them. I'm just trying to figure out which credit will allow me to get lending practices so that I can make my business grow, right? Right. But um, we will have financial um, professionals next week and the week after speaking in our okay. country. Talk more about it. Bank account after incorporation. Establish a banking relationship prior to incorporation or business banking. Why do you think that's important? Why is it important for us to establish um, a banking relationship prior to incorporating or asking for a business account? For what we just went over, um, if your credit score is not strong enough, you need a, um, to establish a relationship with the bank because like you said, you, you could have a guaranteed contract and you, you're in a season where your money's low, but this personal banker knows you, this bank knows you and your company. Exactly. Exactly, exactly. Though the banking, the financial industry is becoming much more data driven, um, which I think is an important thing. Like people need to have systems in place to figure out ways um, um, to, to figure out the health of an organization and make an analysis. But, but capitalism and economics are still based, is centered on trust. And so bankers are typically the first level of defense um, of uh, financial institutions that helps scale businesses. And with that, bankers and uh, personal bankers, um, if you have a good relationship with a personal banker, they, they have seen you um, ask for a home mortgage loan or you have a credit card that you pay off regularly, um, that you pay down or you pay off consistently. And they show that uh, you are consistently keeping um, investments or deposits in their bank. Chances are, if you're starting a business, uh, they, will, they will refer you to the business banker or someone within their organization so that you can at least skip several steps ahead um, in terms of searching for a banker to, to finance your business model. It's not a guarantee, but it helps you um, streamline the process a little bit more um, because people like to do business with people they know. Quite honestly, for me, 
I'm not going to call everyone my friend. I care for all of you all very much, but you all aren't privy to a lot of information to call me a friend, right? There's certain, there are different levels to different people's relationship. That goes in business as well. The more often bankers know you in a good way, not, oh, you know, Carolyn, she owes us money again. Let's give us, let's give her another notice. Let's give her a pink envelope this time. We're gonna to threaten to cut her account off. Like those type of those type of institutions, if you have that relationship with people, they tend not to lend you any money. But if you are showing that you're a good steward of your finances, then that'll afford you um, to be um, to have um, more access to, to different capital. All right, and starting capital. Starting capital typically starts with your personal, your friends, and your family investment, right? Especially when you're in the hustle stage of your entrepreneurship journey, right? You have an idea, um, you have created mass, you create mass. I think that's actually one of your business models, one of the um, presentations, um, customizable mass, right? This is also what my wife is doing right now. Um, but you can she's selling them literally out of our living room. There's fabric, there's sewing machine, there's a press, there's another thing I paid $500 for. A lot of, a lot of these things um, are in your house. She typically, once she creates them, puts them in their car, puts them in her car and delivers them, right? Well, I gave her a personal loan. Like my business gave her a $2,500 loan because um, that was that's a personal investment. Her, her family, her brother-in-law, her sister, um, not only gave her a loan, but they also gave her an opportunity to order, right? Remember my brother owns a restaurant. So what he did was he said, you know what? Would you make us 50 customizable masks? And that'll get things going in the business, right? But th that's a family investment. And once she perfects that, she can then um, market it, broadcast it, put it on her social, put it on whatever website she's using it, um, and then that'll attract other people, right? That's how the ecosystem works. You gradually build. Um, you learn from your mistakes from your family, personal family, friends, and investments um, to help you scale. Now, before I go to the next point, what's a negative aspect of personal friends and family investments for the business. They don't pay you back. <laughs> Either they don't pay you back or there's going to be a lot of threatening going on at family reunions, right? It's a lot of eyeball staring, right? There, there are a couple of them, a couple of my cousins who, you know, they don't approach me when we're in the family setting. I'm going to leave it at that, right? But that happens, right? It happens. Um, is it worth you doing? Who says, who says, raise your hand if you say yes. Raise your hand if you say no. You know what? Both of you all are correct. Not necessarily. I, most people like love to say you always need to invest with your family first. Da, 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 to build. I was, mm, a lot of my family ain't got no money. So, <laughs> <laughs> no need. There's no need for me to try to ask them for money um, because either one, if I ask them for one hundred dollars, they're going to think that it's a million dollars and they're going to hang that over my head. I don't. Have, I don't want all that drama. Secondly, a lot of my family aren't business minded. If they're not business minded, some of the things that I will approach. Let's say I run hit a snag or I'm delayed in an order. Let's just say I brought a thousand dollars from my aunt and I promised to pay her back in three months, but I don't get my, my orders, my, the payment for my orders don't come in until four months. Well, she can call my mom because that's her sister and, <laughs> and complain to her for a month. And guess who's getting blamed? I am because my mom's gonna make make it known that my her sister borrowed money 
car and loan money to me and I ain't paid her back. And so that causes, that causes um, strain in the family's relationship. But I also have family members who are business oriented. And we go through the process. Um, I know where they are financially. I know where they, their mindset is. Some, some of them are entrepreneurs themselves. And they, they may have been in this uh, entrepreneurship space for 20, 30 years. They've made some money. Um, they've retired. They've done some things. And they, they understand the ebbs and flows of business ownership. Those are people you can spark conversation um, and, and, and possibly get funding. With all of that being said, there needs to be agreements and there needs to be things in writing so that everyone can understand where people are um, in your agreement phase. It can either be official or unofficial. The second level of financial um, investment for institutional investments, loans, line of credits, revenue splits, things of that nature. And uh, those are typically from banks or from investors. We've talked a little bit about banks. We'll talk, you'll, talk, you'll hear more about that next in the next two weeks. But there will be some private equity people or some angel investors who, and those are groups of people or organizations uh, filled with in, several investors who take an interest in your company, will provide financial support, but would either ask for equity or ask for um, a financial um and a, and a financial agreement um, to pay back, right? So typically, or a combination of both. Um, for example, if I have this great idea to um, create a business, it'll take me $500,000 to build. I have the, the potential to make $3 million. Um, and it's my, it's sold my 100%. Well, if, if I don't have any money, an investor comes to me and say, you know what? I'll give you $500,000 if you give me 20% of your business, right? That's a potential option I may have, right? Um, if that person owns 20% of my business, I still am in control. I'm still the managing partner because I still own 80%, um, which means that there are there's, there will not be a takeover, a hostile takeover of someone um, trying to um, make decisions for my business because I'm still managing partner. As long as I'm over 50% ownership of the business, I have the final say, right? If I'm 50.1% owner of the business and everyone else is 49.9%, I'm still the principal manager. Always remember that. Um, and so that's really important when you negotiate. Sometimes that $500,000 for 20% is a good deal. Sometimes it's a bad deal. It's a bad deal if I'm only 60%. If I'm only 40% owner, I have another person that's 40% owner, and um, this person wants to be 20%, right? So that's different than me being 80% because I'm no longer in the majority, right? So all of those things, all that being said, it depends on what, there's no set percentage. There's not a right number that says, you know what? If someone says that they will only be 5% of the uh, business owner in your business, that's a good deal. I don't wanna say that because 5% ownership may, for what they're giving you, it may not be enough for you to steal do what you need to do. If someone says, I know you need $500,000, I'll give you $10,000 for 10% ownership. I'm not gonna take that because one, $10,000 is minuscule for the amount of ownership that I'm giving up. I'm not gonna give up 10% of my business for uh, amount of money that I can't do anything with, right? I need at least $500,000. That's the only way I can talk to someone and negotiate. Anyway, we'll talk, we'll talk more about that later. And understand collateral. That's another thing that I was just discussing. Collateral is understanding the types of assets that you have. Sometimes your assets is intellectual property. 
is what you know in here. Your assets or your collateral is your intellectual property that you have either trademarked or that you have gone through um, the process, or the patent process. So if you're the only person in this country that can produce this one thing, that's collateral for you that you can leverage for other people, right? Also, market share is collateral. You may not have the money, but if you control 80 to 90% of a market and everyone has to go through you, that is something that you can use to negotiate if you need finances, if you need assets, things of that nature. Understand your collateral. Are there any questions? Managing the money. Let me just go. All right. Managing money. The number one thing um, that my father taught me, which I am appreciative of to this day, is to maintain a reserve. One thing that he said was always have a red line in your bank account that you don't ever want to go under because you may need something, you may need to fly out somewhere to go to a funeral. You may need to get your car fixed. Plumbing may happen at home where you need to have a major plumbing um, thing done. Always have a, a red line that you don't want your bank account to go on. Now, my first red line was $100. I just didn't have enough money to say I could store up a lot of money. But I knew I need to have at least $100 in the account, even if I just had $103, right? That means in my mind, I only had $3 left in my account. As I got older, as I became more successful, that number increased. And based on my life cycle, that number had uh, gone back down or increased even more, depending on the needs, right? And so it's under, understand the importance of having reserves. Also, reserves help you um, in your off season, right? It's easy to stunt whenever you're in your peak season and everyone's buying lemonade from you because it's 100 degrees outside or you're selling popsicles, it's 100 degrees outside. But when it's 50 degrees outside, you can either one, save your money or two, adjust your business model that is appropriate for the temperature. Instead of selling cold lemonade, you sell hot cocoa, right? And those things, but all of those things take strategy. And most importantly, it takes resources. And so you always need to have uh, money in the bank so that you can adjust instead of buying water and lemonade mix. You may need to buy a couple more things. You may need to buy hot cocoa mix, marshmallows, um, insulated cups. Those are different costs for a different season. You have to have uh, a reserve to, to prepare for that. My next bullet point, cash is still king. Um, people are trying to go to this cryptocurrency as Holly's eating Doritos, making me hungry over there. Carol, let's eat, drinking. And like I'm like, oh man, I forgot I haven't had dinner yet. But I still want to emphasize that cash is king. Um, cash is the universal exchange in our society. Um, we are in a uh, currency um, in the started with Keynesian um, economics. It's a little different now, but he's pretty much the forefound, forefather of our modern economic system, Keynesian, um, from the 1930s, I believe. But he um, pretty much created the fact that currency will be the exchange. Um, the dollar bill will be the exchange that's universal across this economy. Um, so that there won't be any debates between the value of a pen, a pen or a pencil um, in exchange for other services. When there was an agrarian society, when someone would have cows or grains or things and they go into the marketplace, people would could barter and negotiate. You can still do that in other countries, right? Uh, U.S. not so much. Um, but in, in a lot of other countries, a lot of tourist countries, you can do this, right? That when tourism is very high, you can negotiate or barter, right? Well, um, in that model, cash is always king. 
Um, people always, especially if they need to use it for something. I went to, I was in Jamaica last month. I didn't need to get Jamaican currency because people still use the U.S. dollar. So I could still negotiate with the U.S. dollar because cash came because it's still in demand, regardless of the new trends of cryptocurrency, blockchain, things of that nature. Still good though. Line of credit. Lines of, does anyone know what lines of credit are? Could someone briefly describe to me what it is? In your words, not the, not official, not an official definition. So, for me, like a business line. Uh, I'm sorry, personal line of credit or a business line of credit. Either's fine. So, like, let's just say a personal line of credit. It would be like you know companies you can go to. Um, um, so, so first personal loan versus line of credit. Personal loan, like if I go get a loan for five hundred dollars, I pay it off. That's it. No more money unless I apply again. Line of credit. I want. I get a line of credit of like a thousand dollars. Um, I only use $500 of that. And once I pay that money back, that 500 back, I get a thousand again. So you can think of it like a credit card. Bingo. Exactly. And it's, and so, sorry, I really am getting hungry. I think I'm not really, I'm at dinner, but um, the line of credit and the business it's, it's very similar to a personal credit card. Um, and quite honestly, a lot of us, I don't want to say all of us, but a lot of us was introduced into the credit card realm, the ecosystem improperly. Like I know I got introduced to credit card because I was broke and in college and I needed like a pick me up. I needed quick thousand dollars so I can buy because I was living on my own. Even though I was in a dorm, I still needed food. I need to stunt. I need to have <laughs> a lot of things, right? So I didn't, I was not the best um, student financial student of my of my of my spending habits and what that what that did was it affected my credit score it because I used it in ways where I was not replenishing it on time right credit is really just a short no, I don't want to say short because I don't want I don't want to miss our real estate um, terminology but it's really a promissory note that says here's two thousand dollars because I have a feeling that you can make $2,000 in a month. I will give you an advance so that you can cover your costs today, but be sure by the end of the month, you pay me back whatever you spend so that you can have this $2,000 the next month and the next month. That's very similar to a business. Um, why am I saying this? A lot of people, a lot of businesses will take out a $2 million line of credit and build a house that's $500,000 and buy a $100,000 car and then do all these things that are liabilities but are not actually money generating that can feed the ecosystem so that you can pay your, your bank or your financial institutions back. That is an uh, irresponsible way of using business finances, right? So good deal. Um, but it gives you, the lines of credit will provide you financial fl flexibility. So if you qualify for a $500,000 line of credit, that will allow you to, if you have that $10, $10 million contract, it'll allow you to use the entire line of credit to buy and build your products, sell them for $10 million, get your $10 million, pay you $500,000 back to whomever you bought it or who you lent it to with interest. Sometimes lines of credit are zero interest if you pay within a certain amount of time, right? And so that that space is just uh, financial institutions saying, based on your, your temperature, based on your category um, profile, financial profile, I believe you can have an advance of $500,000. That's what a line of credit is. It gives you flexibility so you won't have to ask, beg, and, 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 and plead for, for the financial things. It's utilized, lines of credit is utilized for continuous cash flow business, not income or personal spending. So people should only utilize lines of credit to invest in the business. Let's say 
Um, you need to pay, ensure your staff gets paid um, because the contract won't come in until 120 days. Your payment won't come until 120 days. Well, that's what, four months? Well, you may need to have that line of credit to pay for your set the salaries for your staff, but not to pay yourself. You shouldn't pay yourself for that, right? You should use those expenses for whatever you need to do until you're able to get your, your reward. And salary structure. Um, the difference in salary structure for entrepreneurs uh, is that it, it requires some income discipline. Um, had requiring um, income discipline is, is crucial, is vital um, to, to the health of your business, right? Um, if you're a million, if you're a ten million dollar business, that doesn't mean I should see ten million dollars worth of anything on your person, right? It show it proves to me that you have waste you've utilized way too much of your resources on your personal salary, and out on investing in your business. If you do that correctly, it can help you build your cash reserves because um, you will have an idea of how much money you could spend, um, how much money you can receive each month. So I receive a salary from teaching, right? But I also get money through my contracts and through my profession. Well, I am fortunate to create, I've adjusted my financial spending to where teaching can help build my personal reserves. That will help me remodel the house, do things that I like to do, donate to philanthropies. Whereas a lot of my consulting business um, can cover travel, can cover things that I, I do for my business or things that I can do for personal stuff too. Because I, I draw out an independent salary, even though I am CEO of my business, I made a contract with myself on how much I get out of month, right? That's creating an income discipline so that I can always have reserve to, to expand my business because you never know when someone will approach you and say, hey, Matt, um, would you like to be an investor in this thing? Um, it'll cost 50,000 to get in, but um, you can make 20% year in and year out for the next five years. That's a worthwhile investment, right? That's a, you, I can literally, I will literally make 50,000 extra dollars. That $50,000 will turn into $100,000 after five years. And that's because I've had um, income discipline to where I have enough of a reserve to where I can risk on whatever business deal um, that, that can make me money and help me grow. Prepare you for success. Then I wanna give you a couple of things. There we go. A couple of tidbits, a couple of things of advice before we go into the next um, two weeks um, to, to help you be prepared for your financial success. One, hire financial professionals. Hire a bookkeeper, hire a CPA, and hire an advisor. Those three things are very important in your business and in your personal finances. Um, their pro professionals provide protection. I'm not saying that they're going to guarantee that you're making money, um, but they are qualified to give you advice and to allow you uh, and to invest your money into things um, that's more sustainable, right? And they will also help you set up a retirement plan. It's really important to have uh, a retirement plan to build your future. Also, it's great tax savings. Um, you can save a portion of your salary each year, um, and if it's a if you're a, if you're in a nonprofit educational entity, a 403b, um, if you're in a for-profit organization, a 401k, um, which you can set some of your salary aside each year until you retire. Um, it'll be tax sheltered. Tax sheltered mean um, um, let's just say if you make fifty thousand dollars a year and you put five thousand a year, ten percent to your retirement, that 5,000 won't be taxed. You only be taxed as like as you make $45,000 a year, pretty much. And that'll help um, help you build a savings, all right? 
and I'm having healthy financial, um, having a healthy financial pulse helps you expand your business. It'll, it will allow you to, um, uh, to expand your capacity. You can go from one location to two locations if need be. You can also um, help you uh, become partners with the, with other businesses. So let's just say you want to talk you want to talk joint venture with someone. Well, when you are joint venturing um, with another business, so that you all can get a larger contract together, that business partner wants to know how you spend your money. Right? Do you go to happy hour every day? What you do? What you do with all that cash? Right. That's really important um, because you all it's essentially a business marriage. And when you're married, people who are married, um, I'm learning this now, six months in, is that you have to communicate. And even when you think you're communicating, you could be in very different spots. And that happens in business as well. Um, and so it's really important um, for having um, solid financial individual first having solid personal finances then having solid business finances so that if you want to expand, you'll be able to have the capacity to do so. Fight the urge to cut marketing. Why do I say this? What, what is, what's marketing to certain, to some businesses? So what is marketing? Yeah, in terms of an entrepreneur, what, what do you spend money on marketing? Why is marketing important? It's oh. advertisement. Mm -hmm. Advertisement is one. What's another way of marketing? Your brand. Branding, right? Marketing, advertising, which is different than branding per se. Branding is more of a holistic uh, approach to what your business is from your internal space. Advertising is using outside parties to promote your business. Advertising is like putting things in magazines, Facebook, Instagram, things of that nature. Podcasts, like commercials on podcasts. Um, those uh, can, um, those count as advertising. But marketing, or what was the other one? Branding is something that's an internal thing to try to figure out what is our identity and what do we want everyone to think we are, right? What's another marketing facet aspect of business? Well, marketing helps you get into new um, maybe regions, mm -hmm. um, areas, and grow your business. And I think that people, companies usually cut their marketing budget first because they feel like it's extra, especially if they already have a steady stream of uh, customers or clients. So they feel like, well, we could save money because this is extra because it's good that we could just go on maybe word of mouth or something like that. You're absolutely right. A thousand percent. Um, some people cut marketing initially because either one, um, they think they have enough, they have enough saturation in a particular space um, where they don't need to have their marketing, those marketing dollars anymore. What people don't realize, and I am, um, I lean toward marketing. I'm not one of those anti-marketing people. Most absolutist people who have this idea of, nope, this thing is a crown jewel. And as soon as someone sees it, they're gonna buy it. They tend to not market it market much. Um, or once things get rough and tough, um, they cut marketing. But the effect of that is the fact that um, you, you're no longer exposing people to your product. A good example is social media. The more friends you get, te technically, if you're creating posts two or three times a week, it's better. You'll get more responses and more friends and more followers than if you post once a month, right? And that's because um, you are showing that your relevance in that space. That's what marketing does. Marketing exerts resources to show how relevant you are in a particular space. Because most people in the marketplace don't solely think about one particular thing. Like one company, one restaurant that does a great job that don't have to market 
as much, at least to me anymore, is Chick-fil-A. Because one thing I can think of, if I get hungry, I have made Chick-fil-A a default in my mind because one, it's a proximity, two, of its deliciousness, and three, his marketing that is closed on Sundays. So what is the day that I that I that I urge Chick-fil-A the most? It's on Sunday when I can't have it. And so what do I do? On Monday morning, I'm getting a Chick-fil-A mini biscuit. Four count. I'm not going to lie to you. Four count. Because that was ingrained. They spent a lot of marketing and first of all, they, they spoke folks their energy on branding, saying we want to make sure we have values to where we're not going to be open on Sunday and it's going to be universal for all of our stores. That's a branding thing. Then they market that through advertising, um, either on the book billboards that says close on Sundays, or that you will see those cows, even more chicken cows, will say something about not being open on Sunday to where it's in our psyche. Most businesses are striving for people to automatically know what their business is about, like Chick-fil-A. And so until you get to that point, you need to exert resources. It's not necessarily financial resources, but it could also be consistent posts on social media. It can also be word of mouth. It could also be, um, if you're a local community business and you want to have your community to always come to your place, doing something for the geographical location, whether it's um, sponsoring a, one, one of my dad's businesses sponsored my soccer team when I was a kid, when, when I was in the league. And what happened was they paid for our warmups, but on the warmups, they had the company name on. So he was promoting, he was promoting his company, which is a trophy company, which is needed because as I as we played in soccer tournaments, we we will approach other soccer organizations who may need to get trophies at the end of the season. So it was a smart investment on my dad's business who owns a trophy company. Those are types of things that um, is really important in terms of um, keeping that in your keeping that in your your um, business plan and your finances. Professor Houston. Yes. I also think that um, it marketing it it basically uh, another thing is it shows like your receipts as well. So mm-hmm. like um, like your resume, you know what I mean? Like for instance, if I'm if I'm in the business like on social media or something, if I'm in the business of um, like hair growth, right? Hair growth, um, take pictures. I'll put some oil in your hair, you know, show some before and after pictures. Oh, uh, this person has grew five inches of hair in five days or whatever. And then bam, bam, you know, I think the picture, um, yeah, before and after, right. Um, picture show, um, people want to see pictures and money you know, that's what will will get people's attention. And so that, or if someone um, does, for instance, like a credit repair company or something, they can be like, oh, black out their name, but this person's screenshot of their FICO score or whatever, went from this to this and in a matter of 30 days or whatever, you know? So I think that um, marketing as well shows your, shows your receipts and, um, and then it's beneficial if you can, if you can market to the right uh, to your target audience, not just to everybody, but to your, only to your target audience. Exactly, exactly. Um, you hit the nail on the head, Holly. Um, that's crucial. And, and people like to see those types of progressions because um, especially if, you have, if you're in the service industry or you're in an industry that has, that's producing results that says, you know, I, I guarantee in three months you will have great hair. What that typically means is someone will have to invest in that particular product for 90 days. And in order to have that type of commitment, people need to see, well, what, what's the track record of someone who's already used this before? Like, I need to see someone's hair not falling out week two of using this product, right, before I buy it. Those are very important facets um, for your business for your marketing growth. I actually, uh, after having this discussion, I think I want to slide in a quick marketing lecture, maybe after our financial, um, maybe after our operations. I want to go through all of our core subjects first, but that's a great point. Are there any questions? 
is this was this our again this this lesson was purposed to give you an overarching um, lesson on financial the importance of financials and having a healthy financial um, account as an entrepreneur. We will dive deeper into personal finances next week and business finances the week after that from financial professionals. Well, there are no other questions. Um, I will conclude class today. Y'all have a great night. Um, Autumn and Vanessa, please stick around. And uh, Marcella, please uh, stick around too. Now, do you mind if Autumn and Vanessa, you mind if I sit, create a breakout room for us to discuss things? And then Marcella, I'll create, I'll put you in the breakout room as well. Yes, that's fine. Yes. Can I ask a quick question? Yes. About the project. Okay. Do you want? Do you mind if I put you in a breakout room then? Oh yeah, yeah. Go ahead. That's fine. Okay. Hold on. Let me see if I can do this. I know I can do this. You got it. Oh yeah. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions that I need to add a room to? No one else? Okay, I'm about to open the rooms and I will join you all shortly. Danielle, do you have any questions or anything? Danielle? Yes, I do. I'm sorry. I could have find it. Okay. Do you mind if I put you in a separate uh, waiting room? Oh, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Hold on. Well, just, just hang out here, Danielle, okay? Okay, yeah. Maryville, do you have a question? Or Jose or Jasmine? No, I uh, I just checked right now. Everything seems fine. Okay, good deal. And then, um, again, I've, I've graded your midterms, and I tried to catch up with uh, grade assignments as well. Um, if y'all have, have any questions, just uh, send me a Canvas message. I, will. I am still trying. I'm, I'm behind but I'm trying to try to respond to it. Thank That's you. That's fine. Thank you, Professor. All right. You have a go in Jasmine. Do you, you have anything? Are you good? I'm assuming they're good. Honorable. Okay. I'm going to the rooms and I'll come back to you, Danielle. Okay. Give me a couple minutes. Hi, Professor. Oh, hold on.